Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. How are you feeling? I'm so excited to dive in today. Um, We're going to talk today about the five ways that I have found that you can make a living doing what you love. Um, And we're going to start to look at that under a microscope a little bit so that hopefully that gives you some light bulbs, some light bulbs going off. Um, Before we dive in, what I do want to say as a review, one quick thing, which is yesterday, if I had to boil it all down, I would say you're assigned, you've been assigned and you're needed and you are a once in a lifetime. You know, people value gold and diamonds, right? Gold and diamonds, they cost more because they're rare commodities, right? What's more rare than an individual? Nothing, nothing. You and your DNA are one and done. And you plus everything that you've been through in your life leads you to have a different perspective, a different imprint, a different message, a different gift. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Daniel Pink's work, but I had him on my podcast and he said something that really got to me. He was talking about how important it is for people to actually do what they love for a living and to sell it. And he's a very um, smart person with a lot of integrity. And it's interesting that he talks so much about sales and, and really like the art and the psychology of all of it. And I said, well, what you're saying, I said, it really does give people permission to do their work. And he said, no, I'm going to correct you. I don't think they need permission. He said, I think that people need to understand that it is a moral obligation. It is a moral obligation to sell and do what you do and to put it in the world and to charge for it so that you can keep doing just that. So that that is what you do. That is your life's work and nothing else. I said, wow, a moral obligation. He said, correct. He said, because if you make a beautiful piece of art, God didn't give you that talent for it to stay in your own heart. If you are able to help somebody to save time or to give somebody something that's going to help them be healthier, or you're able to give somebody uh, a piece of software that's going to help them in their life, because that's not about you. We are not here for ourselves. We are here for other people. That is why we were all put together in this world to help each other, to to make this world more, more of a whole beautiful place, which makes complete sense, doesn't it? Okay, so now let's move forward and let's talk about another way that we're going to answer this big, beautiful question, which is what am I here for, right? We're all trying to answer that. So we're going to get into that today even more. So how many of you know the word ikigai? It's a Japanese word, ikigai. And a lot of people have written books on this over the last decade or so. So it's the intersection of three points coming together, what you love to do, what you're great at, but here's the third piece, what the world needs or wants from you, okay? So that is where I love that there is that third element, that we are built to serve, that we are in this world to make it more whole, and therefore it matters, that third piece. So it's not just, what am I good at? That also is not so great because we have that second piece, which is what do I love, right? What lights me up? What am I great at? And where can I find within that something that the world needs or wants? Does that make sense? So I want you to take a second and, and just write that down. What do I love? What am I great at? And what does the world need or want? And sometimes we're not really so clear about what we're great at. Sometimes, sometimes we are, right? There are people, Angela Duckworth, um, she's famous for her TED talk about grit. I had her on the podcast and she said, you know, I've been studying success and I've been studying what is it that helps people to find success. And she said, I noticed in my research that only one third of the population knows their calling from a young age and two thirds. So the majority of us are constantly iterating in a process of uncovering it. So she said, instead of people saying, I found it, or I'm going to find my calling, I like to say, we're going to develop a calling because it's through a process of trial and error. So some people, since they're five, six, seven years old, everyone's saying to them, oh my God, your thing is math. You're so good at math, right? Goodwill hunting for sure. 
Other people are being told since they're a kid, you have an amazing personality. Like when you talk, the whole room stands still. Other people are told you're an amazing basketball player. You're so good at whatever, fill in the blank, right? You're so good with animals. You should be a vet. Not, not true for the majority of the world. So one thing that you can do is you could ask two or three people in your life, what do you tend to come to me for? Do you come to me for advice? Do you come to me for um, a recommendation for where to get the best food? Do you come to me to help you build something from Ikea? And you might be pleasantly surprised or you might be like, huh, three of these people all said the same thing that I'm really good at making space for people, that I'm just really good at gathering people. And, and all of a sudden, everyone feels comfortable. And that might lead to something. Somebody else might say, you know, I know that you're a history teacher, but I actually think you make the best parties and you're so good at interior decorating. And you're like, wow, I guess I am good at that. And I really like, you know what I'm saying? So that might be another little, you know, inquiry into where do you show up? Let the world sort of give you a little feedback. Okay. So now I want to go a little bit further and I want you, this is, this is one of those huge light bulbs. This, this for me really was a, a, a turning point. Clarity follows action. Okay. Clarity follows action. So very often we have this notion that we are going to come up with whatever the answer is first. We're going to have the answer and then we're going to do something with the answer. We're going to have the answer and then we're going to do something about it. But very, very often, if you look at your life in a million different scenarios, the clarity comes after you took action. Think of something really simple. You are looking for a wedding dress. And instead of being like, I know the dress and I know the store it's at, you go try on 16 different dresses every day, and then you go, that's it, right? Say yes to the dress. What about if you're like, let's say you grew up in Costa Rica and you've only eaten that kind of food before, and somebody says, what do you want for dinner? And you're in New York City, you can have anything. And you've only had, let's just say, I know this is a silly example, but let's say you've never had anything else. And they're like, do you want sushi? Do you want ramen? Do you want Chinese food? Do you want Italian? And you're like, I don't know what I want. Why? Never tried it, right? So maybe you get some Italian food in Little Italy. You're like, what's a cannoli? This just changed my life, right? Who's with me on cannolis? Raise your hand if you love cannolis. I do. I had one last night. So, but why, right? I'm like that with my kids. I'm like, just try the food. I don't know. I don't like that. I don't like asparagus. You haven't tried it. Maybe you'll like it. So very often, this question of, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do. It's sitting there because we, we haven't tried as many of the things as we, we need to. Does that make sense? Okay. So I want to talk about how that really is so essential here. And one of the things that I see for people is that they hold themselves back from trying because we don't want to be messy. We talked about this yesterday, right? We don't want to be messy. We, we have so much um, of a, a feeling of needing to be perfect that, well, what if I tried something and then, oh no, you know, what if it's not the best? Or what if people saw me start a business and change my mind or pivot? Or what if I wasted time, right? And that's really sad because the ROI is that you be, get to become who you were meant to be in this world. And I think that that's worth being in a process. And that's what it is. It is a process. And truth be told, this is all so important because as we talked about yesterday, the stakes are really high, you guys. The stakes are really high. The greatest regret of the dying, the number one regret of the dying is I didn't live life on my terms, okay? And that's not okay. That's not okay. We are not going to get to 95 or 100 and look back and say, I didn't do my thing. That's not happening. Okay. So in order for that to be the case, we need to give ourselves the grace to show up and answer the call. 
Like this is, this is why this work makes me cry. This is why I love doing this work because I want to help people get home, right? I feel like who we are is God's gift to us and who we become is our gift to God to fill in the blank, whatever you want to call it, the creator of this universe, higher intelligence, right? And so this is our mission. This is what we've been assigned to do. When we start to iterate and we start to try different things, okay, we, we don't always, we don't always know three steps ahead, what that's going to look like. Is that, is that correct? So therefore what we really need to get is that we have to give ourselves right. We have to give ourselves permission to iterate and what we're going to find. This is why people are always like, how come you chose business coaching? Like, why do you love this? I said, well, it kind of chose me, right? Cause I did all of these things, which led me to this, but I really believe if you want the best therapy, if you want to really grow into who you're going to be, start a business because you're going to meet all your stuff, right? It all comes up and you're going to hit resistance along the way around confidence, around noticing like how you start judging yourself, right? Early on, like it's fascinating. So I want to bring this idea home to you that it really is essential that there is a difference between a hobby and a business. If like I said yesterday, if you're doing a hobby, this means that you could just paint in circles. You could paint yellow, blue, green circles. Like it, it doesn't matter what you're making. It only matters that you're having a good time, that it's relaxing, that you enjoy it. As soon as you want somebody to pay you for this, there has to be radical empathy at the table, radical empathy. Okay. Which means this person really needs or wants what we're making. So it's beautiful. Building a business is a beautiful art of really serving other people because the better we get at understanding what somebody else wants or needs, the better we will be at making a living at that thing. And so that is a very worthwhile endeavor. So I want to give you an example of somebody who was on my podcast. His name is Brian Januski. And it was a really interesting story of him discovering how he was going to make a living. Okay. So he's a potter, he's a sculptor. And when I talked to him, he shared this story with me about how early on he knew, you know, we're talking about the Ikigai. He knew what he loved to do. He liked to sit at a potter's wheel. He liked to sculpt. That's what he enjoyed doing. And he was good at it, right? So he had two of the three things and he was starving. He would make these beautiful sculptures. He went to art school and once in a while, if he was lucky enough, an art critic would write about something that he made. And some of the more avant-garde art critics thought what he made was kind of cool. And year after year after year, he was starving. One day he was teaching a class. He was teaching a, a pottery class and he had the students make something fun. And one of the girls made these like these, these ceramic, like a ceramic bowl. And it was like an ice cream bowl and um, he was helping her with it. So he also made a couple of these ice cream bowls and they were just pink and speckled. And it looked like a, a little picture, a little bowl with like um, the, the lip of the bowl was sort of dripping as, as if like there was ice cream almost dripping out from the bowl. And I'll, I'll send you later to his site. You can see exactly what I mean. His work is called drippy pots actually, but hang on. I want you to hear the story. So a friend of his says was at his house one day, he's eating out of this bowl. And a friend of his says, Oh my God, I love that. Like make me one of those. And he's like, I don't make these. This is not what I make. And she's like, oh my God, but it's so pretty. I would love to have like a set of 12 of those, 12 of those bowls. And he's like, um, no, you know, and um, a few weeks goes by and it's her birthday. And she's like, I would really love that. Like, can you make me that? I'll pay for it. And he's like, fine. So he makes her a set of the bowls. And because he's sitting there anyway, he makes a few more of them. Next thing he knows, one of her friends says, oh, Brian, can you make me one of those drippy pots? I thought those were so cool. Can you make it in a mug? Can you make it into this? And he was very resistant to it. And he wound up being like, maybe I should make these because 
People like them and it makes them happy. So he winds up reaching out to a little shop in Athens, Georgia, a little boutique. And they say, oh my God, we love those drippy pots. Can we put them on the shelf? Can we sell them? And so he, he sends them a big shipping of it and they sell out of it. So he's like, hmm, maybe I'm onto something. Next thing he knows, he goes to another shop. They buy a whole bunch of them. And he, and he gets the, they, they call and they say, we just sold out of all of these. And he cannot, he can't believe it. Well, what wound up happening, you guys, is he got a deal with Urban Outfitters and they start buying thousands of these from him. Next thing he knows, he's opening a huge factory. He's employing all of these people in Philadelphia. He's so happy. He has more money than he knows what to do with. He's making hundreds of thousands. Then it goes into the seven figures. He's able to feel confident all of a sudden. He said that he could now get married because he has this money and he, he wanted to make sure he could be a provider. And his whole life changed. And to me, that's a great example of saying, you know what? I love making avant-garde sculpture, but what I really love, like the essence of what I love is sitting and painting ceramics and making ceramics. I enjoy that so much. And I found a customer. I found a person who wants these drippy pots. So why would I deny them that? Does that make sense? And when I was in the music world, you guys, I knew that at the core, I loved being in a studio, picking up my ukulele, singing, writing lyrics. It made me happy. And I thought, I, I, I'm so happy that Target and Coca-Cola want to pay me to write these songs. I love that Disney soundtracks just asked me to write two songs for a movie. And I would have a couple of these like too cool for school songwriter friends who would say things to me like, Kath, you know, it's not really cool that you write music for film and TV. And I'm like, why? Like, I like doing it. It's really fun. And then you know what, you guys, I was able to make $200,000, $300,000 a year consistently. And then I could go write any record I wanted. If I wanted to be Bjork one day or write something that was just for me, of course I could do that. But the good news was I wasn't starving. I had a way to do something I loved that I was great at. And I found a customer, a person who wanted to pay me and pay me really well to do something that I loved. Clear? Okay, so I think that that's a really good story because, again, what I'm trying to do this week is give you a sense of possibility and really help you understand, like, what is it, right? What is it that's going to help me tangibly, not up here, make it theoretical, but how can I really do something I love and get paid to do something I love? Okay, so now I want to go through with you the five major ways that people can make a living doing what they love. I'm gonna break it into categories. Are you guys ready? Okay, let's do it. So here we go. So first of all, we were just talking about it, okay? The first category of people would be makers, okay? Makers are the songwriter, the person who takes the photography, the person who makes the vegan cupcakes, the person who makes the drippy pots, very, very clear. That's a maker. Okay. The second se segment would be somebody who's te a teacher. Okay. So some people, they don't do the photography. They teach people how to take pictures. Some people are not making the vegan cupcakes. They're teaching people how to cook. Does that make sense? Okay. So you have makers, you have teachers, and we're going to keep going into this deeper and deeper. Then you have service-based packages, okay? So a service-based person would be someone who maybe is giving you organizing in your house, someone who's cutting hair, somebody who's a party planner, somebody who designs your website, okay? What else? You have now, what's really cool is there are people who are, they're, they're more like curators and they create memberships memberships, right? People who want to gather other people. So maybe you're not making the vegan brownies and you're not teaching people how to make vegan food, but maybe you just love the topic of vegan food. So you create a membership and you have a hundred, 500, a thousand people in it. And within the month, they meet up on zoom once a week. They're in a Facebook group and maybe they pay $47 a month to be a part of this. They get to meet other people who are like them. Maybe the membership is about mindful moms and there's some practices and people get to, you know, have somebody come on zoom and, and share something with them, teach them something. So that's another thing. 
The last one is really cool because this is very, I would say this is newish in the last 10 years or so, which is just like content creators, right? Content creators. Like maybe you want to create a podcast and you want it to be all about you love football. So it's it's a podcast that's all about football, football fans, or even more specifically, it's just for the Steeler fans. It's just a Pittsburgh Steelers podcast. Or maybe you want to do a podcast all about positive psychology and happiness. Well, the thing about that is, you guys, you don't even have to be the expert. You could be a person, again, who's just researching that, who's investigating that, who's doing a podcast about this part of history, who's doing a podcast about women who have cool jobs. That's all that's required is that you're interested. You know, it's interesting. They did a study at UCLA on what lights up most in the brain. And they thought, is it love? Is it hate? Is it jealousy? Do you know what it is? When they put an fMRI on somebody and they give them different prompts that elicit different responses, the thing that lights up most in the brain is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. So when a person is enthusiastic, it's infectious. It doesn't matter if the person's talking about Bruce Springsteen and how much they love Bruce Springsteen and the podcast, you can't not listen to it. Even if you don't like Bruce Springsteen, all of a sudden you're like, I love listening to her talk about it. Or maybe this person is talking about their obsession with DIY crafting. And I know a lot of us have found our, our way down the rabbit hole sometimes. And you're watching this girl, right? Who's talking about what she just got at Bed Bath & Beyond and she loves candles and she's obsessed with it. And you're dying laughing and you're, you're obsessed with her enthusiasm. It's infectious. Okay. So now are you guys ready? Let's go back through that because one thing I want you to do. Okay. And you can take out a pen and paper. I want to make this extremely doable. I want you to get it because very often we overestimate what it's going to take for us to be able to leave our nine to five job and do the thing that we love. And we very, very much underestimate what is actually possible. And I want you to see this. I want you to see this. So I wrote out a couple examples and I want you to, I want you to be asking yourself what could be possible for you, right? When I went through those maker, right? Teacher, memberships, service-based packages, content creation. We're going to go through it again one by one. And I want you to jot down just as an exercise, just for fun. What would you do? What would you do if you were making something? Even if you're horrible at it, just as an exercise, what would you teach if you were teaching something? What would you curate if you were making a membership about something? What would you, um, what would you do for someone if you had a service-based business? Would you organize their closets? Would you what? And what would you do if you could be paid to create content? What would you just love to talk about forever and ever? Make a list. So let's go through it, okay? You have makers. Take a second. What might you make? And now here's where I want you to really see the, the tangible nature of what I'm saying so we can de-escalate the overwhelm. Here's, a, here's just an example for you. If you had an item that you sold that was $20, whether you're a, a jewelry designer, you know, so maybe you make a necklace, $20. Or maybe you make vegan corned beef. My friend Jenny does that. And you sell a pound for $20. I'm just making this up. Or you make a mug and you sell it for $20, just for easy math. If you sold 40 items, okay, at $20, that's $800. All right, now that's really important to get because we're gonna go through each of these and I want to show you the, the potential in how much you can make from doing things. I want you to really write it down because so often, we just outright, we dismiss, I want to do this thing. Oh, forget it. You can never make money at that. Nobody makes money. Just go get a job for your uncle. Just go work at this shop. Just go. It's like, hang on a second. Okay. If you were going back to the story of Brian Januski with the drippy pots, what happened was he wound up not selling a pot to a person. He wound up selling a bunch of pots to a store. That's more of a wholesale business. But 
he really started to see crazy amounts of money when he had two or three boutiques and they were selling out of his items. My friend Jenny was selling her vegan corned beef to a deli in Los Angeles. After a few weeks, one deli liked it so much, she went to another deli. She wound up getting 10 delis to buy 40 pounds of corned beef from her a week. Vegan corned beef. It adds up really fast. Then it went again, again. Then she wound up getting into all the Whole Foods and it was like crazy. So with Brian, when he got the big client, which was Urban Outfitters, that was a game changer. So I want you to get that as a maker, you could sell to each individual person or you could sell local. I'm not even talking big chains. I'm talking even if you sold locally, there might be a way for you to sell. Let's say you have 10 buyers and they each bought 40 items. If it was $20 a piece, that's $8,000 for 10 buyers. Let's say 10 shops buying from you something. I just want you to play with this. The reason why I want you to play with this is because when I was so, so depressed working at um, all my day jobs and really worrying that I would one day be sitting, you know, feeling the way my mom felt for so long, everyone was like, well, you have no other choice. You're never going to make money as an artist. And all they kept thinking about were the starving artists who were busking is what we call it when you put out a hat and you're singing, you know, on the subway platform. And yeah, you make, what do you make at the end of the day? 17 bucks because people throw a dollar in. When I read the article, you guys, that people were licensing music to film and TV, I went, oh my God, I didn't realize that Coca-Cola would pay you $60,000 for the right to license just for the use, not the ownership to license your song. And I went, oh my God, that's so brilliant. Then I really could just focus my energy and my enthusiasm on one or two of those a year. And I would be making more money than I've ever made at these day jobs. That's $120,000 a year to get two clients. So I want to de-escalate the overwhelm. Okay. Let's go to the next thing. Let's say that you were a teacher and you're teaching a course and you're teaching it online, let's say, because that's so much of what's happening right now. In fact, just so you know, because of the pandemic, we've seen a 300% increase in the amount of classes people take online. And it's amazing, not just because they want to grow their business, but really for fun as well. People are taking chess classes. People are, you know, meeting up with people and learning how to, we're seeing people learning knitting and all these different things because they have time and that's the way we're connecting. So let's say you taught a class. Let's say you taught people how to use their phone to take better photos. Let's say you taught people how to plan a wedding in with a budget of $5,000 or less, whatever it is. Let's say your class was $497, $500. Let's say it's an eight-week program. Let's say you had 50 humans in the whole world sign up for that program. That's $24,850. 50 humans taking a class. I'm not talking about thousands. I'm not talking about 100,000, a million. And we're going to keep building every single day of this five-day challenge. We're going to keep building on what's the next step. And tomorrow I want to talk about getting the first five sales, getting, gathering an audience. Really, what does that look like? What is marketing? How does it work? And how does it actually work? so that you're not just a part of the noise, so that you don't feel like you're doing something that's off, like you really feel like you are standing in your truth, okay? So this is a, this is something I really want you guys to get. So what could you possibly teach? What could you possibly teach? I know a woman who was, she's married to a fireman. She was a second grade teacher, struggling, struggling every year, year after year. She got so sick of it. And she said, I want to figure out a way to make more money. Well, she came up with an idea. She said, well, what do I know how to do? She goes, you know, I know second grade math. That's what she knew. And she thought I could teach second grade math teachers ideas for curriculum. And that's what she did. And she built like a whole empire around it. There was a woman named Teresa Greenway who was a janitor. She was literally a janitor in a motel single mom, just working so freaking hard. And she has a son and a daughter. Her son had autism and her daughter comes to her one day and she says, mom, 
we cannot live like this. This is not working. And he needs more resources and we need to come up with more money. And she says to her mom, what if you taught other people how to make sourdough bread? And her mom's like, I don't, I don't know how to teach that. And she says, well, why don't we just try it? And her daughter gets out her, her, um, her iPhone or whatever phone she had, takes videos of her mom, puts the course up on Udemy. Her mom made $85,000. Then she added a second class. This time it was extreme sourdough. It was like advanced. She made another hundred grand. She's now making $250,000 a year teaching people how to make sourdough bread. And we'll talk more about this. And truth be told, the reason why I love doing my program made to do this is because I am clear as day that you can be making money doing things that help other people that light you up. A hundred percent clear. We've seen this. Every person who comes through this program is like, oh my God, it's such a light bulb. I'm getting it. And I want to be able to pick each one of these things apart and show you this is how you create a course. This is how you do your first three steps. I want you also to get, as we go through these five things, I've done all of these. You don't have to do just one, right? Look at people who are multi-hyphenate, right? Look at Amy Schumer. She's not just in the movie. She writes, she's directing. Look at P. Diddy. Look at The Rock. Didn't he just create his own vodka? Like we are able to do more than one thing. I'm a songwriter. I create content. I'm a podcaster. I wrote a book. I also teach courses. I've taught courses to people on songwriting. I've taught courses to people on how to create a podcast. I've taught courses to people on how to figure out their calling and actually turn it into income, right? And we're going to go to the next thing. I have a membership. And I also want to tell you one other thing that you can do as a a content creator in in one second, because I want to talk about how to monetize content creation. Let's go to the next thing. Okay, memberships. Let's say you had a membership. And let's say you had a hundred people in your membership, and your membership was about DIY crafting, right? My 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 friend Jennifer Allwood is an amazing example of somebody who created a membership. She used to be a painter, then she created a service-based business where she went into people's homes and she did like hand-painted murals in people's houses. Then she, from there, realized, I love all kinds of crafting. So she created a membership, and it was like $47. And she just started telling everybody she knew, you should be in this membership. Once a week, we talk about all different kinds of DIY crafting. We, do, we talk about you know knitting. We talk about painting. We talk about all, and people loved it. And she brought in other speakers to come in and teach something. And then other people in the program got to do even like co-working sessions on Zoom. They got to share with each other the thing that they're so crazy about. People love paying for an experience and paying for connection. So let's say you had 100 people in a membership and they were paying $47 a month to be a part of this curated environment of like-minded people who are doing a certain thing, who are learning a certain thing. That's $4,700 a month. And your job, you don't even have to be the expert. You could curate it. You could say, you know what? I have a friend of mine who did this. She was a new parent who wanted to learn more about how to how to be a mom. So she curated a membership for other moms and she brought in experts so that instead of each mom on their own looking at books and calling a a child psychologist and, and talking to someone about lactation, she's like, no, we'll be together, we'll give each other support. I'll hold the space for the support. That's all I have because I'm not an expert, but I'll bring in the experts. A lot of the time, these experts are enjoying the exposure. They're not even charging you as the membership owner to pay them to come in. It's such a win-win. And if anything, maybe you paid them. If you had 47, if you had 100 people at $47 a month, that's $4,700 a month. So you pay the person 200 bucks for the hour. Awesome. Great. What if you got 200 people in the whole world of seven and a half billion, you get 200 people. That's $9,400 a month. It's amazing, right? Amazing. So memberships are really cool right now and you can do them from your home. Last thing, content creation. Okay. When it comes to content creation, what people often think is that the way you make money is you sell ads. That's the lowest 
common denominator. Okay. The way that it works just real quick, if you wanted to start a podcast, you get paid a CPM, which stands for cost per millionth, which is a thousand. So for every thousand downloads, you get a CPM, which is somewhere between 25 and $50 for every thousand downloads. So once your show has 30,000 downloads a week, 60,000 downloads a week, and you have one or two advertisers on your show, yes, it can add up to 4,000, 6,000 an episode. It can start to be very, very lucrative. However, the thing that will always be even more lucrative than the ads is what you personally sell to your audience. So if you had a blog, if you had a podcast, if you have an Instagram and you are selling an event, you are selling, even if it's a virtual summit, right? Let's say your podcast is all about the Steelers, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you decide for $97, you're doing a summit all about fantasy football and who's in the draft and people from Pittsburgh and the whatever it is. And people are just going to come talk about this. If a hundred people came at $97 to a one day or two day online summit, that's $9,700. Okay. We've done events, retreats, summits, and now we do so much online and people love it. Okay. And soon the world will open up and you can do things in person as well. But what if you, if, if you really start to get it, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. So tomorrow's a really good day for you to come back. Cause we're going to really start to talk about how do you get your first 10 clients? How do you get your second group of 20 clients? Like this is really, really doable. You guys, it's so easy to just be like, forget it. And I'm really wanting to show you, you don't need a million people to love you like life for you to be able to leave your job and go do something that you love. Let's talk about the service-based packages because I missed that one. If you are doing that, right, let's say you do logo design and you have five people pay you $1,500 to create a logo. Maybe you give them some branding, you give them some colors, you create some templates on Canva for them to use for their Instagram or their website. Five people, five clients at $1,500, five clients in the whole universe. That's $7,500. Okay. And now you have to ask yourself, but what is the market price for this? Maybe it's not $1,500 for these things. Maybe it's $5,000, right? So this is very, very much a real thing. And you're going to hear a little bit more about this as the week goes on. But as an example, Sadie, who should be here right now, Sadie's awesome. Sadie Simper was in Made to Do This two rounds ago. And she comes in the class. She's super talented. She knows that she loves to do logo design and all of this stuff. But it's sort of like, can I really make a living at it? That's why I came to the class. I don't know. It was COVID, you guys. And here Kathy Heller is having the nerve to do Made to Do This. I'm like, of course I'm doing Made to Do This now more than ever. I'm like, let's go. Like, I want to help you make a living not needing to get a job, right? Because the world has changed so much. And we are able to go directly to customers. We can we can find everybody with a click of a button. The people you need to serve are on the other side of your Instagram, the other side of your Facebook page. And we can do this very simply, without there being a whole song and dance. You don't need 100,000 people on a list. You can just start to figure out one thing that you can do to serve one person and you can rinse and you can repeat. So Sadie decided to create an offer to do some logos and to start to help people with their you know, branding. And she can tell you better than me, she's here, but she wound up making, she said she stopped counting once she made like $30,000. And she was like, holy crap. And her husband, I, I believe, had lost his job because of COVID. And she's like, sink or swim. And she's so happy getting to do something that she loves, right? So which one of these, I'm just curious. Now, here's the cool thing about being a part of a creative process. And I want you guys with me, messy. I don't want A plus students. I want C students. I want the person who is willing to just get it done, do it messy, fail forward, right? So I'm just curious right now, just want to take the pulse, maker, service-based stuff, memberships, content, teaching, which one of these in this moment is feeling the most exciting for you? Tell me in the chat. I want to hear it. And remember... 
that you get to do more than one thing. Okay. You get to pivot. It's always amazing to me how there's never been somebody on my podcast who knew exactly what they were doing, had the perfect offer, and then took it to the market. No, it's always that somebody starts with just a little idea of something, and then they pivot over here, and then they pivot again, and they get led to, oh my God, this is the actual thing that I'm making. I didn't even know that this is what I was doing. I mean, look at me, for example. All I knew was, God, use me. I want to be in service. I knew I wanted to like pour into people, and I thought, songwriter, better be famous. Oh, that didn't work out. Hmm. Oh, I could write music for film and TV. Great. Oh, somebody asked me to teach a class. Start taking, you know, start taking that direction. Next thing I know, I start a podcast. Now I'm sitting here with you. What if I had never started down the road of many pivots? I wouldn't even be here, right? I, I know that we all heard this story, but Steve Jobs took a class in calligraphy. And he was just mesmerized by how beautiful all these fonts were, right? And he, he just kept walking toward that. And then the question sort of arose, which is like, what if I could make technology beautiful? What would it look like? What would I make? What would it be? And now, right, what is Apple really about? Apple now is synonymous with creatives. Do you want to make your own movie? get an apple? Do you want to write your own script? Do you want to design your own artwork? Do you want to make your own music? How cool. Like this man who started with a love of this just looks beautiful to me. What if it wasn't about the fastest software, but it was about something beautiful, making something beautiful. And he just kept walking toward this whisper. Did he know the day that he started fiddling around in his garage that he would make an iPad? No right? So when I look at the people that I've had on my podcast, I see action takers. I see that the biggest thing is that most people, when I, when I meet with people or I talk to people or I get emails from people, they are convinced that they have a business problem. I have a business problem. And it's not. It's a courage problem. Because the answer is always in the doing. You might start with a membership because it seems like the easiest thing to try right now or starting with a course or starting with making some flan because you happen to be good at it and you start selling it to your neighbors. Next thing you know, you're party planning. Next thing you know, who knows? It's a courage problem. We need to get that the way that we will be in service is where, where we are led and we are led by getting that feedback. A business is a relationship. It's, it's people. It's listening. And it's also listening. What feels good? You know, you might do something and say, here I am again. I'm teaching this course, but it doesn't light me up. Well, that's not going to work because in order for you to really put the juice in it, you've got to feel lit up, right? But I promise you will find it. And, and the reason I wanted to go through these ideas, these five major paths that I see on a daily basis, I can name you friends for every single one of these categories that are making so much money doing things in each of these categories. And I wanted to share it with you because I do believe, like I said yesterday, we reach for the highest branch we can see. It's a fact. And if you, if you are not aware of these possibilities, you might not even walk down that path. Um, one of my friends told me the story about a little kid who was in his class at Teach for America, you know, Teach for America. And he told, the, he told the kids, hey, I want you guys to draw what it is that you want to be when you grow up. And some kids drew an astronaut and some kids drew a firefighter, whatever, all these different things. And this one kid at the back of the class, he's just like moving his pen around the page. And he walks over and he says, Brian, what's going on? I want you to draw whatever you want to be when you grow up. And he says, I can't think of anything. And he starts to talk to him and he says, okay, I got it. And he wa the teacher walks away and he comes back and he says, what'd you draw? And he goes, oh, I, I drew a pizza delivery man. And the teacher, my friend, he goes, okay. And he calls his mom later that night and he says, I just wanted to talk about Brian. What do you think is going on? 
it took me a long time to get him to do it. And then when he did it, he drew a pizza delivery man and I wanted him to dream bigger. And she said, I can tell you what's going on. His dad's in jail and his uncle is a pizza delivery man. And my friend said, oh, I, I think I get it. That's his best case scenario, right? That's what's being modeled as the ultimate highest branch that he could reach for. And so for so many of us, when we're growing up and then you, you know, you go to college when you're freshman, 18 years old, like, what do you want to be? You're like, okay, well, I'm kind of creative. And I think there was a guy down the block who was in advertising. So I think I'll do advertising. It's like, okay. (laughs) It's all that you know to pick from. When you go to a restaurant, are you like, I know what I want, or are you happy to see a menu of options, right? And then you're like, oh my God, I didn't even know they made that. Let me try that. That sounds interesting. We need to see possibilities. And I'm hoping that today you're starting to go, oh my God, that's a possibility. This could be a possibility. This is so here for you. So many of us walk around with such scarcity mindset. Look, we have this thought that no one would pay me for that. Everyone's broke. Not true. It's not true. There are still people, you know, we just had the Christmas season. It was one of the biggest, most, you know, off the chart spending seasons ever. The stock market is at such a high right now. That means that companies like Amazon and other companies are doing really well, which means those employees are being paid, which means they're spending money. Like it's the clients are there. The money is there. And I believe that everything in nature was designed to live to its fullest potential, right? Every bird, every tree, and each one of us. So really, we are the gatekeepers. We are the ones who hold ourselves back because we're always thinking like, forget it. It's not possible. But all that there is out there is abundance, right? The sky, it's abundant the creatures, the amount of different species in the Amazon, all the different faces of humans and the languages we speak and the flavors and the spices, the world is literally abundant. And if you look out the window, you notice that nature is not shivering. It's not anxious. It's, it's all happening. It's, it's trusting that there is a, there's a flow, right? We don't trust. And therefore we cut ourselves off from being in process, from trying things out. So I want to ask you, you, we talked about this yesterday. What would be two businesses? You know, who are two people who have careers that you'd want to switch places with? I want you to think about, hmm, if I switched places with this person, if I was doing it, how would it be a little bit different? Like, what do I love? Yes, they're doing that. But what would I improve upon? Or what's maybe missing, right? When I had Bobby Brown, the makeup artist on my show, we talked about how she got into makeup and she said, I used to do makeup for all these women and I would think I love makeup, but boy, do I wish there were makeup colors that were the actual colors of women's lips instead of like making up people and making them look like someone else. And she walked the floor of Bloomingdale's and she looked at the different makeup that was available. And she said, I feel like what would be different if I did it is I would accentuate beauty that's already there. So I would want to make a palette that doesn't have bright blue eyeshadow. And in 1980, whatever it was, that was a little bit of an original idea. And so I think that you could start thinking about like, oh, I would want a coffee shop too, but I love cats. So I think I would name every flavor like this is Persian and this one is like the minx and this one is the tabby. And then everybody would get a little fortune and they would all have these little like cat stickers on them. And then people who love cats and coffee would be more interested in my coffee shop. Like start to think about what you love and how you might slightly change or slightly add to what's already out there. I literally have examples for each one of these different pieces. And I think that the biggest thing that holds us back is that 
When I say to you, what do you want to be? A maker? What do you want to do? Create content? What do you want to do? Teach a course? It's still like, it's scary, right? It feels overwhelming. And what I want to say to you is, again, it's it's about giving ourselves permission to just do it and be messy, right? And that's why I gave you that permission slip yesterday. So just as an, another example, um, she became a friend of mine. Her name is Danielle Silverstein, and she was listening to my podcast and she, she was going through, this is all public information. We talked about it when she was on my show. I had her on. She was going through a really hard time in her marriage and she thought they might not make it. And she was looking for other things that would help her through that time in her marriage. And she felt like every podcast about marriage was like people with all the advice, nobody was struggling. So it actually made her feel really it made her feel worse. And after listening to my podcast, she said, I told Adam, my husband, we're just going to do this because we have nothing to lose. We're already on the brink of divorce. And they started a podcast called Marriage and Martinis in their living room with no fancy microphones. Their three kids, they were like, you know, doors slamming. You could hear people fighting in the background. And sometimes on their podcast, they would cry. Sometimes they would fight. They shared all their dirty laundry about addiction and gambling and mental illness, all the things that they were dealing with. And within nine months, they had 300,000 downloads. They were featured in the New York Post. Then they started to see people writing letters saying, you saved my marriage because I don't feel alone. I feel like there's somebody else out there who's struggling with the same things. And that saved their marriage, right? And now they have millions. Now it's been two years. They have millions and millions of downloads. And she has like almost 300,000 or more followers on Instagram. And they're making all this money from it. And they're making an impact, right? Um, we, we had so many stories like this. But um, another one of our Made to Do This students, Hannah Blunk, who was in Made to Do This, she had been a teacher in Alaska. Her brother was in a horrible motorcycle accident. She moved to be closer to him. And she needed something to do, but she also wanted to have her days pretty much free so she could be there with him. She decided to start helping people organize their homes. And she created this whole thing called the orderly nest. And she started make, she made more money in like three months than she ever made teaching. And she loves it. She loves doing it. It's amazing what happens when we just start. I'll tell you one more, which is so good. And some of you know this one because Greg Franklin, I had him on the podcast as well. So if you listen to the podcast, by the way, you should all go after today and subscribe to the podcast because it is free. And we put out an episode every single day, twice a week. They're like an hour long. There's some interviews. There's a great interview with Donald Miller from yesterday. Um, But we do five or 10 minute episodes, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, which will just give you a little of that extra encouragement every day. So you should go subscribe. So Greg Franklin was listening to Don't Keep Your Day Job podcast earlier when we we started the show four years ago, and he was miserable. He was working at a factory that made dog food. Like this could be a movie, right? And he was writing in saying, I'm so unhappy. I'm so unhappy. And his job to make matters even worse was standing in front of a machine that made plastic bags for dog food. And he said, you know, Kath, I just did that thing that you said, like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I did not want to do that. And what happened was one day on Facebook, he saw a recipe for a cheesecake and he's like, "Mm, I don't know. I've never been good at making anything at all, but I'll make a cheesecake. So he like follows his little whisper, makes a cheesecake. It's bad. It burns. He realized he needed a cheesecloth. He tried to not use one. He's like, I needed one. Comes home from his night shift a couple days later, can't sleep. He sees another ad for cheesecake because Facebook now knows, oh, he likes cheesecake recipes. He makes more cheesecake. This time it came out pretty good. He made two that time. So his family's like, it's pretty good, but we're not going to eat another one. And they lived in like the middle of the the Midwest, um, I believe in Missouri. And so he goes down to the local fire station and he says, would you guys like a cheesecake? And the guy's like, sure, you know, small town, but why not? The fire chief calls him a week later. He says, were you the guy who brought in that cheesecake? He says, yeah, that was me. He says, it was so good. And one of our guys is having a birthday. Can you make 12 of those? And he's like, sure. So he makes 12. He starts to like it. 
Next thing he knows, he's starting to feel a little bit like excited because for like 20 years, he was so unfulfilled and he doesn't know what to do next. So he starts to take the next tiny step and all he can think to do again, it's not about resources here. It was resourcefulness. He took a freezer bag. He put like 10 cheesecakes in the freezer bag, walked into his little town, opened the door to the post office, opened the door to the salon. Anyone want to buy a cheesecake? People were like, what? He started selling a few cheesecakes every day. Next thing he knows, a few months later, he goes to work. He's starting to like his little side hustle of his cheesecakes. He's starting to sell 15, 20 a week. And he makes a mistake at work and he gets called into the boss's office and he says, you're fired. There was a mistake on the line. We lost a bunch of the stuff. You're fired. And he's like, oh my God. And he goes home and he says to his wife, I have to look for another job. We're going to lose our health insurance. They have three kids. And she says, no, you're not. And you guys, I can't make this up because it's insane. She says, do you know what today is? Have you looked on Google? No. She goes, look it up. Today is National Cheesecake Day. What are the odds that you just got fired from a job you hated anyway on National Cheesecake Day? She says, you've been standing in front of a machine for eight years. Before that, you did air conditioning repair. You have been unhappy for so long. Finally, you have something you love. You got fired. It's a sign. We're opening a brick and mortar. He says, we have no money to do this. Small town, not a lot in the bank, three kids. She says, we're doing it. I cried so hard hearing this story because every person matters. I don't care if you are a guy who lives in Missouri or a girl who grew up in India. I don't care where you are on this planet. If you are here and you are breathing in and out, you deserve to be fulfilled. You deserve to have meaning and you are needed to be a happy version of yourself, making something, sharing something, because the transaction is much more than the fact that you made a flower bouquet or you made a cheesecake. The world starts to feel another person is lit up, doing something, having fun, and and you're good at it, right? And he didn't even know he was good at anything. He winds up being really good at this. So they open a brick and mortar. And he says to me, Kathy, we made an agreement between my wife and I that if we can make enough money in the month to pay the rent, we would keep it open for two months. What do you think happened on day one? They opened the store day one, first day. They've never opened a store before. They made twice the monthly rent in the first day. And that's amazing. You know what happens then? I'm blown away. He and I had been corresponding all this time. I have him on the podcast. Another listener of the podcast calls him and says, hey, I just heard you on Don't Keep Your Day Job. I have a a, a chain of stores near you in the Midwest. I want to carry your cheesecake in all my stores. Next thing I know, we have listeners who listen to Don't Keep Your Day Job who say, I'm driving from Kansas City to go get his cheesecake. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. He winds up making more money than he's ever made. He winds up being the number one Yelp reviewed cheesecake in the whole state. The pandemic hits, no big deal. He's more busy than ever. Now he's not just making cheesecake. He's also making these like giant cookies. You guys, instead of being completely stymied and stuck because we're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. How about we get into action? How about we start to try something? And maybe, just maybe, there's a tremendous fulfillment in finding a thing that we like to do that we're good at that somebody will pay us for. If you thought about any of these people who I just mentioned, who are able to do something they love and make hundreds of thousands of dollars doing it, how good would that feel, right? How good does it feel to be successful doing something you like that somebody else wanted? It feels so good. And I think what we've done is we've just sort of, we've taken ourselves out of the equation completely because we say, forget it. There's no way I could ever make money at it, which is just such a limiting belief. And like, I'd really, I'd like you to write down, thoughts are not facts. Thoughts are not facts. And just because you think it does not make it true. So we have this thought, I can never make money at it. Or we have this thought, well, in order for me to leave my job that I'm not so happy at, 
I would have to do something so purposeful with a capital P. I'd have to do, I'd have to be famous. I'd have to be Beyonce. I'd have to cure cancer. How about I make some drippy pots and I get to say, I have 200 employees making ceramics and I love what I'm doing. Or how about I have 10 clients and I'm designing logos and I didn't even go to art school and I'm making more money than we've ever made. How about it? How about it? Who's with me? Who's feeling it? All right. So how excited are you for tomorrow? All right. So tomorrow we're going to go into what is the next step? How do we sell? How do we market? How do we find our first client? How do we help that first client actually feel served so that we can get client number two and client number three? Who's excited for this? Love you guys.